Hello everyone and welcome to The Spectrum. I'm your host Ronan Beckerman and this is session number four. And this week I'm joined by the evil twins of Archviz, Peter Guthrie and Henry Goss from the Barnery in London. In this session we discuss the transition they made from practicing architecture to being solo Archviz artists and today running the Barnery and working on projects designed by their heroes, Tadao Ando, Renzo Piano and Peter Zumthor, to name a few. This session is sponsored by Axis Design, the makers of Anima, the all-in-one crowd management tool developed to make the process of adding 3D people to your still images and animations fast and easy. Find out more about Anima and their 3D people library by clicking on their link or banner in the show notes. Here we go everyone, session number four with the boundary. Let's roll. It's great being here at your studio in London for the second time for me. And to kick off this podcast, I would really love for each one of you to tell me a little about your own background and how you came to work in architectural visualization. So my background is in architecture, uh, same as Peter's. Studied architecture, went to uh, the World School of Architecture, got quite into architecture, having not really had any major passion for architecture growing up. I was, I was very into design and craft and um, making stuff. Uh, when I went to university, I, I was I, sort of under the impression that architecture was the best design-based degree that had, was the most thorough and rigorous uh, sort of degree in design, essentially. And so I, that, that's really why I got into architecture. And then I actually resisted computers for a long time because the World School of Architecture, as a lot of universities were at that time in the late 90s, still very insistent upon hand drawing, learning how to draw by hand um, to really understand the craft of, of, a, of making a drawing because you can't, you can't cheat a line that you, you know, you have to commit to a line that you're drawing with a pen in a way that you don't with a, a computer. So I, um, I certainly resisted computers initially um partly because of the culture of the university and partly because i was you know not that into computers um hadn't been since since the 80s when interestingly enough i was so i um i then uh realized probably in my year out that through this 3d technology was coming in and in a big way and people were starting to do it a lot more and I suddenly realized that if I didn't get into it, I was going to be left behind. I wasn't going to be, you know, every, all my, you know, friends and stuff were getting into it on their year out and stuff. And I thought, well, you know, I'm really kind of inspired by this. I really like what is now achievable on a computer, having previously not been that interested in 2D CAD drawings and stuff like that. Um, so I just knuckled down and, and learned it uh, on my year out and then and didn't really look back and then ever since then working as an architect I was always the person even though I loved working drawings and loved designing and loved detailing I was always the person that if there was a if there was an opportunity to, to do some 3d I'd always I'd always put my hand up I'd always be the person doing it and I didn't see it as a lot of other architects saw it as being a negative thing oh you know you're going to be pigeonholed as the render bitch in the office i never saw it like that i was always like oh cool i get to draw some you know rad 3d stuff for some cool projects and get involved with other things around the office so i always saw that as a as a positive thing so that's that's how i got into it i'll pass you over to peter um well i i was always interested in architecture partly because my dad was an architect um he studied architecture in, in Scotland, as did I. So I was always kind of very firmly set on becoming an architect. But I think actually I may have got into architecture um, through computers in that I always remember going to, to my, my dad's studio um, and seeing uh, these amazing CAD machines that they had just got into their office. The, uh, with, the plotters, the one that... Um, they were, I don't know what they were called. It was kind of b before mice became <laughs> primary input <Okay>. um, <laughs> device. And they actually had these things with crosshairs that you you kind of positioned on your drawing and then plotted points. Um, and then they magically appeared on screen on kind of monochromatic monitors that were actually way bigger than the monitors we have. Okay, so that was the early days of like computer yeah, aided design. It was kind of proper CAD. Um, so I always remember seeing that and thinking, wow, this is, this is just so amazing. This is the future. Um, 
And I think probably, yeah, that really was one of the um, experiences that that made me want to go and study architecture. And then throughout my architectural um, uh, studies, um, I I think like Henry, we were we were kind of discouraged from using computers. But I I just defied my my tutors at every turn. Um, even when we had to do t- kind of technical drawing exercises where we had to calculate shadows, you know, falling on a wall, um, I cheated and used computers, worked it all out, and then just traced it by hand. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's kind of my um, my architectural training, and then um, worked as an architect for um, about five years before finally deciding uh, to move away from architecture and get into visualization, kind of realizing that actually you can make a career out of making beautiful pictures uh, was quite a big moment. So, yeah, that's okay. how it happened. What was it, was it specifically that, the realization that you can make a career out of it, or was there something more deep in the decision to go with just, you know, wavering the opportunity to create buildings in the real life because in my case it's rather similar story uh my father was a civil engineer and i was as a young kid i was uh visiting with him in buildings that was you know barely uh uh, built so i've seen a lot of concrete all the time and that's probably why i like concrete so much these days and i initially studied computers and then i decided to to learn architecture but midway I realized that I'm not really interested in building the actual buildings. Yeah. Once I have the visual, then I, I'm satisfied. So yeah, that's enough. Yeah. That, that was the creation for me, the image. Was it the same for you too? Um, yeah, I think it became very apparent during my studies that um, my interest did kind of flag a bit once, you know, we started talking about technical issues and construction and structures and how everything stands up. You know, when I did projects, um, it was kind of back to front for me. I always started thinking about my presentation of how am I going to present my ideas? And that was kind of the driving force, what kept me interested. And then, uh, I mean, I, I love architecture and, and have so much respect for architects that can kind of see through buildings um, from start to finish and be and you know keep the focus and throughout a, a project that can last five ten or even longer um, 20 years so yeah I prefer I think I've always just been more interested in in images of buildings and in f- photography and just crafting um, representations of architecture rather than actually working as an architect right. something to add to that is that is that you know my my sort of side of it comes from a love of craft and design and making and stuff like that and i i not only do i see what we do as a sort of end in itself to a certain extent even though it is a means to an end to you know developing a graphic that will eventually become a building i do see a lot of you know the best work that we do as individual you know works of art um, the images themselves. The images themselves, yeah. And not necessarily, not in a sort of pretentious way, just in that a, a, a really powerful architectural image remains a really powerful architectural image in perpetuity. It's some of the, um, there's always the, the Mies van der Rohe um, tower, sort of yellow paper, charcoal drawing. Or I don't know what the medium is, in fact, but I just remember seeing it. And it was it had this kind of abstract ethereal quality that that was just very powerful as an image, a lot more powerful than some of the built examples. I mean, I'm not saying Mises' built examples aren't amazing, you know, they, they are. But um, but there was there was, so there was that it was you know a, an end in itself. But there's also the fact that the criticism um, that we get more than anything as architects that have gone into visualization is that. Um, we've abandoned the rigor of architecture and we're just doing this sort of facile, you know, dr- picture drawing and all that kind of stuff. And that we're no longer engaged in the sort of the architectural discourse and we're, we're just sort of peripheral to it. I would say for me and for Peter, certainly we're more involved in 
<clears throat> architecture, excuse me, than, and, and design than, than possibly ever before, because we now, um, today is a good example. We're, we're working with architects all over the world, our heroes. We're working, you know, on design details, really fundamental design details from quite an early stage sometimes. And just today we've been invited, um, to Peter Zumthor's office in Switzerland, um, tomorrow to spend a, a five hour workshop with, with Peter working on the materiality of, of, of the gallery spaces in his new project at, um, LACMA, Los Angeles Museum. So, I mean, that is a kind of privilege that, you know, as an architect, I mean, that's just unbelievable for, for me. And yes, I understand, you know, I, I do also enjoy the, the, the detailing and, you know, waterproofing details and, you know, basement tanking and all that kind of stuff that I've, I have enjoyed that in the past, but what we're doing now fulfills a sort of, creative urge um in architecture far beyond just drawing a picture of some of a building than someone's that someone's designed that someone else has designed you know it's much more integral to the whole process than that and i think that's not given the credit that it should be and so in, in many senses you, you get the key to the garden of architecture you always wanted to do just you are like part of a team not right now for that sure that, that does the images for the architects yeah uh, that you always wanted to to be like or to work with and you're always part of a team when you're working you know you might be working on um you know at richard rogers on the leadenhall building um but your entire job in the whole building may be um sanitary wear schedules or something like that so yes you're in the you're an architect and you're working in the architect's office but you don't necessarily have any more input than than other parts of the team we're all part of the team we're all working in the built environment we're all aiming to you know finish with a a building that's that's where the whole procurement process ends we're just part of the we're just a slightly different part of the part of the picture you know compared to what we used to be how does that differ from uh, the photographer role i mean there's the architectural photographers that take the pictures after the building is done and there's you that makes the pictures before the building is done is there any difference from your standpoint? Is there any difference from the architect standpoint? Does they, do they get more credit or more uh, prestige? Or uh, maybe they are less criticized for what you said, like uh, you, you abandoned the rigor of architecture. I mean, do they get the same kind of uh, sentences thrown at them? Um, I think often, you know, when we encounter problems um, in, our, in our kind of... Uh, our job um, when we come up against comments, for example, where uh, clients or architects or other members of the design team want to want to help us recompose an image, for example, or change change lighting or whatever. Um, I always kind of try and remind everyone that what we are aiming for is um, an image that looks as good as. Um, and a photograph that might be taken at the end of the whole process by an architectural photographer. Um, so that's, that's kind of our, our goal. And it sometimes can be frustrating that, um, an architectural photographer, um, may be given more freedom to present their interpretation of what the building is than, than we are. Um, because it's, because the building is is complete and because they're limited by weather. there's no stakes anymore i mean it's finished yeah. there's nothing like to be afraid of in terms of the visualizations the photographer just take pictures of the final yeah. product yeah i mean we we obviously have to convey the the designer's um intention and everyone we have to keep everyone happy but you know ultimately we have to make beautiful images that uh, re represent our our work and and you know it's kind of i think where the role we have is to we have to um understand architecture uh, and also find things about the 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 design that interest us um so that we can kind of add our own element of uh of feeling and of you know picking up on on parts of the design that that really interest us in the same way that an architectural photographer would at the end and sometimes you know um 
architects I've worked with, when they see an architectural photographer's photographs, they're often surprised about uh, what the photographer has picked up on and what elements they liked. And it might not be exactly what they had in mind when they designed it. It might not have been their design, their philosophy or their kind of um, intention, but they end up liking the architectural photographer's representation of their building more than, um, or it may add to their understanding of their own work. And I think that's what we always try to do and not just um, do exactly what we're told in terms of composition, but we actually fight very you know, strongly always to to say this is what the building is to us. Okay, so um, maybe I'll ask you a, a kind of like a challenging question. Um, if you're stuck in an elevator with a dream client and you have only 30 seconds to make an impression on him, what, what would you say? That's interesting because our entire medium is visual. So to convince someone verbally that we're the person he needs to, to work with is would be very difficult very difficult i would say and quite often i you know even though i'm you know a loud mouth and tend to just talk all the time it's uh, it's actually our work that does the talking in in an environment where you're trying to convince people um or you're trying to get you know you're trying to get commissions yeah but how would you describe what you do i mean i get asked that a lot i mean really So what what am I? What are you? What do you do? Oh right, if people right, if someone yeah. says right, if someone says what what do you do? Well, yeah, that is interesting because yeah, I, I tend to say we do um, architectural visualizations of um, proposed buildings, largely for marketing purposes, but uh, the old style artists' impressions, you know, because that's what you know. They the the industry is not new in that people have been doing you know drawings of buildings of proposed buildings for hundreds of years it is difficult though because then people say oh right, okay so do you get do you get the computer to do that and you're like well yeah you know that's the kind of tool um i think that you know it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult one that um it's an idea that a lot of people think they understand um particularly people that are you know architects and stuff like that they have a you know a basic understanding of architectural photography of composition of of graphics and of 3d software all architects do uh, these days tend to have you know greater to a greater or lesser extent um so people think they know uh the medium that they're dealing in and and sometimes th and then they that's when they treat you as a render bitch and just bark instructions at you and say i want this um when they actually don't understand it which can be difficult um and with with regard to thinking of a of an architectural photographer in the same way people don't tend to Everyone knows how to use a camera and everyone thinks they're an architectural, you know, everyone thinks they're a photographer when they get their iPhone out, but there's actually an awful lot more to it as well. But, um, no, it's a, it's a difficult one. We're back in the lift. I can't think. Maybe Guthers can, can, can expand upon the lift, uh, quandary. I think it, it goes into the, into the distilled why are you doing images of unbuilt buildings? What, 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 what drives you when you wake up in the morning and, Why do you do this? I mean, since 2002, maybe earlier. Yeah. Um, the push pull bar days. Uh, why? Well, partly it comes down to just a, a love of the, the geeky nature of what we do as well. Because the, um, you know, we've, I've always loved photography and um, the idea that you can make photographs that look like real photographs but purely in 3D and and more and more these days with um creating entire like environments landscapes with trees and and grass and fog and skies and it's kind of uh there's for me there's always a thrill when you um when you set the basics up in a in a scene and you start to see it coming together in front in front of you um so that's kind of that's quite a driving force i would say and in the office we you know we spend a lot of time um doing R D and encouraging everyone to to try new things and um you know what gets everyone excited in the office is when someone's experimenting with 
particles and trying to make dust or Henry's come up with a new technique of making fog or something that's that's kind of so there's, there's partly the the technical side of things um, and then the the com the kind of fo- photographic elements there's a lot of of refining and of talking about compositions and um, and then lighting as well just fine tuning and, and making things work or if they're not working revisiting lighting entirely starting again so I think that's uh, yeah Okay. To add anything. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd agree with that. And I'd also say the thing that I love about this industry, I entirely agree with seeing that when you set it up and you press render and suddenly this real looking space just appears. And, you know, as an architect, I absolutely loved that because it, it meant that I could really get into the spaces that I was designing, you know, very early on beyond a sort of SketchUp model, which all architects now use to, into actually lighting it with proper GI and proper, you know, light. And you can, you can feel the space. And now with, with sort of 360s, just knock out a quick 360 and look at it on the iPad or put it on the um, VR goggles. And actually you're in a space that was just a figment of your imagination one day ago. You know, so that that kind of instant gratification isn't just as sort of as puerile as it sounds. It's not just like, oh yeah, you know, you don't you don't have the rigor of thinking about architecture in 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 the way that you know architects should um, in plan section elevation and really inter- you know interrogating the space before you get that that sort of that moment of being able to experience the space. I think it's a, it's just a it's another tool in the armory of design that is incredibly powerful, incredibly positive, and that all great architects would have used um, in the past had they had it at their disposal. I'm sure, and uh, and a lot do now. A lot you know, a lot of the best architects do use use this. Um, but also, I enjoy you know when I get up in the morning and I'm coming into work. We've got a, a great studio. You know, there's there's twelve of us. 12 of us here now and we're all doing this cool work and I, everyone's got these, you know, these different specialisms and everyone's doing this amazing work, but it's essentially not, I've said this before, <clears throat> having worked in the architectural profession, it's, it's, it's not a, a very stressful, um, industry. It's not like, you know, high level law or, or architecture, you know, designing buildings is, is, you know, and coordinating all the people on, you know, on large construction projects is, is a, is a serious endeavor and a lot uh, pretty stressful. Um, and it's not that I'm sort of, you know, bending over and saying, Oh, I want an easy life, you know, and drawing pictures is easier than building, you know, designing buildings. But it's, I just, it's just, I get a lot more enjoyment out of it on a day to day basis. I get fulfillment and enjoyment. Um, from what we do here more than sort of higher end, you know, sort of stressful, um, professions. I mean, it sounds lame, but no, it's actually (laughs) not. Um, so if, if I'm trying to connect the dots, I mean, both of you, uh, quite unique in, in the visualization you've been making in terms of the world building aspect of it. I mean, I know Peter always strive to, uh, build the entire scene in 3D and then explore it as if he's a photographer inside that virtual world. And in, in your case, I think it was it was the same. So there's a lot of similarities between both of you. I mean, both of you are architects, both of you use SketchUp, uh, love SketchUp, uh, and uh, and then you decided to 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 join forces. So what what was the the main drive? In, in transitioning from being a solo artist, being an architect to an architect, uh, actual practice and, uh, forming the boundary. What goals were you striving to, to reach? What were the aims? Did you have like a predefined winning picture? Like we know this is what we want to get it. We have to join forces. We have to build a team towards achieving those goals or was it something that was spontaneous yeah it was a, it wasn't so contrived as saying right you know it wasn't hanging around saying right i need a business partner to push this on or, and and peter had worked on his his own for longer than i had um it was it was more it was more that we became friends at a certain time when both of us were <coughs> excuse me doing our own thing um peter as i say had been working on his own in 
as he describes it, total isolation for quite, quite a number of years. And uh, I'd set up Henry Goss Architects and then I'd got more into 3D. And as I got more into 3D to publicize my own work, I became more aware of Peter, who had been um, employed by an ex-colleague of mine, Magnus Strom, to do a project of his. So I'd become acquainted with with Peter and I'd met him a few times. And then he, when he came to London, we got to know each other better because, you know, c- common interest and and just got on really well. And so we became, we basically became friends um, before we had any thoughts of um, doing anything together. And then uh, we ended up working in the same studio for convenience sake and because it was fun. And then we were just dabbling with, um, you know, Peter was starting to get more and more inquiries um, where he couldn't, you know, he had to turn so much work down. And, and I was beginning to sort of dabble with employing people with Henry Goss Architects, but really um, pushing on the 3D front rather than the architecture front, but um, but hadn't quite acknowledged that that's what I was doing in my own mind. You know that I really was going into 3D. I was still sort of thinking on the architectural lines. Um, uh, so yeah, we just both reached that kind of point at the same time where we thought, well, actually, we need to raise the game, need to get a few more people in, and um, to do it together just seemed like a logical thing. It seemed you know, far, more fun, less stressful, share the burden of it, um, you know, and, and just do it together. Cause it just seemed like, and we both, we're both, we're very different, you know, in, in terms of our characters as well, even though our, our approach and our understanding of what looks cool and what is rad and what we, you know, believe in and the architecture we like and our entire, you know, philosophy about, about design, you know, very similar, but our actual characters are quite different. Um, so it just worked. And, um, then when we started and I think it's worked and I think it is working and I think it's great. Okay. So, um, the types of projects that you do are pretty specific. I mean, it's all uh, high end, uh, us based mostly uh marketing so i assume you 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 have the same approach you had even before the boundary but can you tell us uh what is your what what are the key factors for your approach to doing these kinds of projects with which usually involves a lot of images uh animations and now also uh, vr deliverables so what what's the what's what's the approach and what's the workflow looks like uh so you can actually manage a lot of projects and each one being a big one on his own well the um, it kind of it comes back to um this desire to to make complete 3d environments um and it you know the doing doing these large projects where we have like at least 20 images plus films plus vr um it's actually that that prior workflow of of building everything in 3d actually it turns out lends itself to that kind of large project um also you couldn't um you, you can't actually um do a small project with that workflow because it would just be not at all um, cost effective. Um, so that just kind of ties in quite nicely um, in terms of being able to offer um, VR and 360s and film. Um, and also, you know, we have this approach of um, building, a, even if we're doing, say, a living room, building a, the entire scene um, regardless of what way the camera is going to be pointing, um, because we don't like to predefine cameras at all with clients. We do, out of necessity these days, we've started um, having a kind of first step in our workflow where we we like to, to get cameras signed off. Um, but we, we kind of, we reserve the right at any stage to to go and amend those compositions because we are in effect the photographers um so having having everything built in 3d means that we can go back and revise compositions and then we can also very easily offer 360s and um, create a film out of the spaces we've done 
so that's the you know that's just the way it seems to have worked out that we 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 started doing bigger projects um and once you do a couple of projects like that then you tend to get more offers for for similar work along those lines so. do you find that the clients need to play catch up with you when you work with this kind of approach because usually um I mean, you have to have everything, even the stuff that they didn't want initially in that image because they want you to show like the specific view and then you ask them, okay, so what's on the other side? And they might not be fully prepared for this kind of uh, well, full scene build-up. Actually, that's never really been a problem in that we, we tend to get, obviously, the... Um, a pack of information from the architect um, and they will not know what our camera viewpoints are going to be. And then in terms of interior designer information, we tend to get a pack of information per, per room. So they're not given uh, a chalk um, mock-up, for example, and told just to populate that. It's more, okay, here's the living room. We need furniture for that room. So we haven't really found ourselves in that kind of situation where we have to go back and say, oh, actually, we need, we need this. This session is sponsored by Quixel, the makers of Megascans. Quixel is on a mission to scan the world, offering us an all-encompassing library that we've dreamed for so long. You've heard the story by Quixel founder Teddy Bergsman in session number three. If you didn't yet, you should. Visit the Megascans library by clicking on their link or banner in the show notes and explore their full environment packs and individual assets you can use on your next project. So in terms of the tools you use to create those uh, images and, and animations, animations are, are something new for you. I mean, you, you mostly uh, did stills to the, the boundary. So the tools you use, software, render engines, is it all really in the render? I mean, how, how much of post-production are you doing, uh, especially when we talk about films and, and VR? And any kind of insight you have on that? I mean, what kind of an approach you have to have so that films and VR are easy to produce afterwards well I'd say that um, our approach of getting everything done in the render um, is even more valid when it comes to to film and, and VR because um, we don't we're not very technical when it comes to film we we use after effects and premiere um, we don't do much uh, in the way of post-production in in film uh, and then in VR it's actually very difficult to do post-production um, when you're dealing with a 360 image you can't just start layering stuff up in, in Photoshop mm -hmm. so so that's kind of you know we in office we've actually found ourselves being even even more strict when it comes to doing animations that we want everything to look right in the frame buffer um, so that we we do as little as possible afterwards what does that demand i mean in terms of uh workstations in terms of schedule time what, what do you have to set up in order to be able to facilitate this kind of in render everything well obviously the more power the better in terms of workstations and i think most of our workstations are i mean we're, at any given time if we're buying new workstations we buy the most powerful available um which is, you know, it's an upfront investment, but it's actually, you know, for the scale, particularly as we get bigger. So, you know, one workstation, an expensive workstation, isn't as expensive as it used to be when there were only three of us or two of us, you know. Um, but yeah, you need, so you need that. You also need, as you say, time. You can't just turn around. If someone comes to us, which they do a lot, and say, you know, I've got, I want this entire, it happened yesterday, in fact, I want an entire project done. By the 17th of January, I want three minutes of, of film, um, full rendered animation, and look at Alex Roman's third and the seventh as an example of what I want. And I want you to do it in two weeks. <laughs> it's just like, um, you know, you, you can't do that, obviously. But there are people that, that will say, you know, that turn stuff around very quickly. It's all post-production, all Photoshop, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
But a lot of our projects are, you know, we probably spend, I mean, significantly longer on every project than Months. any other Viz, Viz company that I know. Um, we don't necessarily charge more for it. We just we just spend more time on it. I mean, we're probably we're probably ultimately less profitable um, than a lot of Viz companies. But I think in the long term, we're gonna we're we're pushing the industry forward. You know, we're we're really trying to invest time in in R and D and and new technologies and new ways of doing things and keeping it you know keeping it pushing forward. Okay, I know now that the studio is working entirely with Corona Render uh, versus previously you've been working very long time with V-Ray. What, what, what do you find in this render engine that makes the job for you easier, better? This is another good example of, um, of the R&D. You know, Peter has always been into R&D and, and really, you know, he needs to do more of it now. He's getting you know, dragged away with the sort of, you know, the... The more mundane aspects of running a business and you know coordinating people in the office, but his real strength is is research research and development you know and um where we got into corona because of him um when it first came out you know one of the first alpha versions, Peter got straight into it he was like, oh, this is new render engine, you know and it looks really cool, and um you know I'm going to use this instead of v ray and I was like, well, what you know what are you on about you know this is just this new thing and and we haven't made a wholesale we've we've pretty much we're pretty much in corona now more than v i mean far more than v ray there are certain things um that we still have done in v ray and do do in v ray but almost entirely on commercial projects we're now in uh corona just because i mean like we've said many times before it's it's got there are two things one it's just got that that sort of usability it's got that for architectural visualization it's got it's so so simple and you know no settings and amazing amazing feedback with the interactive and the way you light things and the way it all the way it all works um also the simplicity of it being a new program so it hasn't got um overburdened with you know uh, things being added and um and then the legacy things that they then can't take away because you know they add functionality but can't take away the old stuff because people want that for their old scenes so you know it has the benefit of being a new piece of software um it also has the major benefit of um uh the guys that that basically program it the the guys that at corona um are amazingly receptive to conversation about the development of the software so peter's talking to them virtually every day you know oh i've got this idea for improving the frame buffer or you know how about you add this or you know da, da, da. and they're and they're they're constantly asking for feedback and actually taking account of the feedback we give them so to have that dialogue um not that we didn't have that with vlado v-ray he was very good as well you know the but it being a smaller enterprise with fewer people using it and a newer bit of software, you know, it, um, it's, it's great. It's great. Okay. So any, anything else besides Corona that you're testing right now? I mean, uh, in terms of VR or real time, I know you've been exploring Unreal Engine, but, uh, is it something you found viable within your workflow? Clients we, look for it. We've put a little, very small amount of, of time into it, um, it didn't end up <laughs> being very successful, unfortunately. Um, but it's, yeah, I mean, we're keeping an eye on it for sure. Uh, but it, it just, it, it still feels like there's, there's so much, um, preparation that's needed up front before you, you can actually start seeing something that you're happy with in yeah. terms of, visual quality um whereas you know we with corona especially with um interactive rendering um it's pretty much at the stage where when we're building scenes up we we just get interactive on and leave it on and just start putting things together and that's kind of in a way more more real time for me than unreal is because okay the unreal thing is is real time once you've put all the work in um but we just like to see it real time as we go <laughs> okay so that's in, in terms of your own workflow but let's say even if you cracked the unreal engine secret and you have it like you know how to do it you can do it fast I mean, do the clients really ask for it or do you even know what you can deliver to them with that with that kind of technology I, I, 
It's just a kind of un, unknown, uncharted territory. Uncharted territory, really. We have had clients, you know, express interest in it, um, but it's, it's also quite hard for us to sell um, when we don't really know ourselves what what the experience would be like. Um, and it's kind of there's a sort of fundamental question I think about as as photographers or filmmakers um, wanting to have creative control over what we ultimately show the end user and when the end user can actually just go and go around as if it was a computer game um, and have uh, an unguided experience um, that's a bit of a problem I think so so the curation of the experience is it has a value or has priority I mean you want to be able to yeah, focus absolutely. To, yeah. to focus the, the, the viewer yeah. on what you wanted to see I mean I think if a lot of people saw what what goes on behind the scenes in our discussions with clients even when it comes to a still image in terms of how they want a view composed so as to accentuate the height of a building or make a building look like it fits in you know there's there's so many discussions going on behind the scenes that um when it when it came to uh, doing some kind of fully interactive vr experience um i don't know it'd be it, it would be a very interesting process that's for sure because we we do since we've made the jump into doing animation, we have realized that actually um, when a client sees a moving image rather than a still image, they they suddenly kind of sit back and actually accept a lot of things that they would not accept in a still image because they feel like they have this complete control over a still image. Whereas as soon as something is moving, they tend just to say, let things slide or don't maybe don't even notice things that they would with the still image yeah okay and uh, the, the animations that you do the, the ones that we've seen so far are, are more akin to uh, moving stills rather than uh, full blown animations like scripted with uh, you know characters or people inside is this like uh, a gradual transition that you are currently at I mean or is it something that you are fully satisfied with uh, in terms of um, the films, I, I wouldn't. It's interesting because for me, the you know the the terrible word, of course, is walkthrough. That um, which is something that that really turns me off. You know, that's we we will never do any anything like that. Um, and I think people have realised that actually that yeah, I mean, it's you know, gone. No, it's no one is interested in that anyway. So, yes, I do kind of see it as it is kind of moving images, but we are becoming more and more interested in filmmaking and the kind of camera movements that filmmakers actually use. Um, so, you know, we're we're kind of always experimenting with with different ways of representing a space, um, and actually, when you look at our short clips animations put into a film um, they tend to to match the shot footage uh, of the filmmakers we're working with very well so I don't think it's just that we're doing um, moving stills it's more uh, the type of um, camera movements that are suitable applicable to architecture tend to be quite simple um, graceful movements um, and not, you know, something you'd see in an action film. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back in time when you were three, uh, you two and Phil, and today you are 12. Now, I don't know if it's a coincidence, but you've been doing two masterclasses uh, at State of Art Academy, and uh, uh, I think you mentioned it once in, in discussion we had, maybe in the, in the last masterclass, that uh, you kind of liked the idea of having uh, employees that you can like mimic the experience you had within the within the masterclass so 12 students in the masterclass 12 employees <laughs> at uh, the boundary is this something that you take out from teaching these kind of classes and bring back here to the studio 
in terms of the dynamics and what you allow employees to do? Yeah, I think um, actually the before I, I started getting into the, the workshops and for State of Art Academy, um, that was there was always something um, that I missed in in working in an office uh, when I worked in Edinburgh for Richard Murphy Architects. Um, it was always an office of about 20 people, 25 people. And there's something about being with a bunch of incredibly talented people um, and having something to offer and being able to teach people how to do things. Uh, I think it's, you know, that was, that was the best thing about working um, in an office for me was was just daily questions that I was able to answer and help people improve their work. Um, so that's kind of one of the, the best things about um, the boundary is that we've created this this atmosphere of learning and being able to answer questions and help people is incredibly satisfying. So then and in doing the workshops in Venice, that's a, that's a kind of same thing, albeit in very distilled format um, and quite intense as well, <laughs> um, but incredibly rewarding. Uh, and I think in what we've, Henry and I have realized is that we need to actually do more of that here. Um, and that was, that was a consequence of, of helping Jean Piero and Roberto out in Venice, uh, and realizing how, how much, how rewarding it was and how much the students got out of it. Um, and in fact, coming back from Venice and then hearing our own staff say, Oh, I wish I could have gone <laughs> makes you realize, okay, well, let's spend more time doing that here as well. Cool. So in terms of each one of them, in terms of responsibilities, uh, is, is anyone in charge fully, uh, on a project or do they collaboratively work on, on projects together? How, how does that work in the studio? It tends to be I mean, when, when we set up, we having come from an architectural background where you have project architects who are in charge of the project and then other people might help them and they coordinate all the, you know, all the other, all the other people and the consultants and all that kind of stuff. We entered into sort of employing people with a similar mindset because we'd always considered ourselves project architects and then project visualizers, you know, as a result. Um, and having work, you know, when you work on your own, you have to be the project visualizer. You have to be the person that does everything because there's no one else to do it. So, you know, we're often asked this question actually, and it's, it, it only became clear to us after having employed quite a few people that, that in, you know, in some parts of the industry, there is quite a division of labor, um, which we, which hadn't really occurred to us. And, and in fact, it turned out that there were, there were whole roles, um, within the industry that we didn't even know about, you know, we thought, Oh, well they can do that. And, the, and then it turned out that they weren't able to do it. They didn't have the, the, the requisite skills and expertise. Um, and it became apparent that that's because where they've worked before in the industry, someone else does that bit, you know, so that was a, that was quite interesting, but I think we've managed to instill, um, we've got Angela, who's our project manager who tends to oversee everything, which is more like other vis businesses, uh, vis studios, um, which we, we didn't previously have her and she's amazing at sort of coordinating everything. Um, in terms of, you know, gathering information, distilling information, and then delivering that to the 3D artists. Um, and we, we hadn't really realized that they were, you know, people were 3D considered, considered 3D artists. We were like, well, of course they're going to gather the information and distill it and liaise with the clients and, and set programs and run the project and project manage it basically. Um, but it turns out that that's not really how the industry works. But, but I think with us, it, it kind of does work like that more because we've instilled that kind of thing. I think people do appreciate it and people have really taken it on and, and it gives them a sense of ownership over a project that they may not have had elsewhere because they've got day-to-day -day contact with the client directly. They can pick up the phone, even though Angela might be, you know, doing a lot of the framework they've, they've got, direct contact uh, contact in a way that they may previously not have and as a result we've got everyone in the office 
the idea really is that everyone is a project leader on a certain project and then everyone else chips in with them, but they maintain ownership over that project. So for example, Luke is, is, um, you know, he spent quite a bit of time helping Phil with a project that Phil was running. Now Luke's running a project and you've got, uh, Victor and Redbeard helping him out and working with him. But then, you know, independently, they may have their own projects as well. Okay. Uh, and you that, too? That, that we may chip into, you know, okay. and similarly, we may have projects that we're, that we're sort of running and then other people will help us out or will help other people out. We've got a slightly more strategic overview of everything that's going on. Um, we tend not to, you know, just have a project that we work on without anyone else. Um, it's evolving all the time though, because we've grown from, you know, three to 12 in a fairly short period of time. So it, it's, evolving. is that the sweet spot or do you, I mean, or is it based on the projects demand? I mean, do you have it's, some kind of, Number? I don't think we have any, we, you know, it's all very, it's all evolved quite naturally. Um, we obviously did this, make a decision to get a bit bigger. We moved offices, you know, moved office and now we've basically filled up the office, which is one restricting factor. Um, but similarly, we, we thought it seemed like it, it seems to be a nice size that every, you know, if there's a project going on in the office and there's a sort of emergency on it, there's a, there's enough people to, you know, take up the slack that it, that it means that no one has to work all night or weekend the whole time, you know, there are people. So it seems like a nice, a nice size for the kind of work we're doing at the moment. And it also allows us, you know, we've now got the render power, you know, to do more things in house. We've got, you know, the expertise to be able to say, and, and the number of people that someone can spend a few days doing some R and D and not worry about a project falling behind or anything. Cause there's a, a sort of critical mass. So I think it is good. I think up until about, seems about 25, most studios go up to about 25 and then beyond that, I think they start to sort of either fragment across different offices, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Quite often, quite a lot of offices have, you know, an, an office in New York, which we may have in the future, seeing as most of our works in, um, on the East coast of the United States. Um, but I think in any one place to maintain that kind of tight knit group that is required for a really creative environment, um, it's a it's a good size at the moment. Yeah, no, I mean, it seems you have a pretty nice uh, vibe going on. I mean, uh, we've seen the videos you've been posting online, and uh, there's this uh, boundary rib and uh, sailing going on. So, uh, is it part of you trying to flourish this kind of environment for uh, employees to want to come to work here, to love working here? Is it something that's natural for you? Are you actually? Working at it. To, I, to, to yeah, for sure. But I mean, the bottom line is we want to have fun at work. Me and Peter want to have fun at work. So they're the kind of things that we want to do. So they're the kind of things that we want everyone to do. You know, it's, we're not going to come into work and say, right, you lot, you crack on. We're off on the rib. We're going sailing. You know, that's ridiculous because they're all our friends as well. So it's like we want to go and have fun with our friends. So okay. it's it's as simple as it. it's not. A, it's not as calculated as saying, look at us even though you know we put out these videos and stuff and it is a bit kind of look at look how cool we are look how look how much fun we have but at the same time it's like that is in fact what we've been doing um everyone's always going around with a gopro of some sort and so we've ended up with all this footage and you stick it together in a montage and um it's fun so how, how do you hire a friend yeah interesting well initially we did hire friends in that we knew phil phil was a friend um, and he was the first and then Luke was Phil's friend and, uh, and then John human was everyone's friend, everyone's friend. <laughs> and then, uh, and, and then, you know, other people have joined as we got bigger, we sort of thought, okay, well, you know, you make a judgment on people. We always, we always do a, a, a double interview where we, we get people in if, you know, if they've got the, obviously the skills and they're, and they seem, you know, and they're keen, we get them in, we talk through their work and stuff. And then, um, if we like them and if they like us and if it seems, it seems appropriate, we get them back up for a, for a beer, you know, like a couple of days later, say, you know, come up for a beer, meet the team. Everyone all goes out, we have a few beers and then, you know, instantly whether you're going to gel with them and whether they're going to be good for the office. You know, if everyone after a couple of beers in the office says, God, that guy was a weirdo, wasn't he? You know, it's not <laughs> going to work regardless of how talented they are. So um, okay. that's really important for us. Oh, that's, that's a nice way to go about it. Uh, so what else would you suggest? I mean, I, 
obviously, based on what you said, you, you're hiring. I mean, it depends on the work. You're open to, to take on more employees. So uh, what would you say to any prospect that there are like two, three things he should focus on if he wants to work in the boundary? Um, I think, well, obviously you have the, the requisite skills, but it doesn't, just because you don't know every bit of software and that you're not producing the best images ever, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're it's not, not eligible. It's not possible. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, um, and what we what we don't want is super keen people to think that they're somehow inadequate. It's usually the people that think they're inadequate that are the perfect people because they have a bit of humility and they've got that thirst for for knowledge and drive to get better. So they're often the best people. I mean, Joanna and Anetta, I remember both who who started quite recently, both of whom previously worked in house at Foster's. Neither of them really thought. You know, they're the, they might not have applied had for a job here had they not, you know, had a had a contact. You know, had a friend that worked here. Simon uh, was a friend that uh, of theirs, and you know, introduced them to us. Um, and they're amazing. You know, they hadn't been given the opportunity to flourish in an environment like Foster's, where they were having to churn images out for, um, you know, design communication and stuff like that. But you know, given given the opportunity, they're absolutely amazing. I mean beyond what we thought they would would be when they joined um so i think that's a that's a really important part yeah, i mean based on what you said i mean the, the employees hire employees which is probably one of the best uh, things that can happen you know if an employee feels so good about the workplace that he uh, recommends a, a friend oh. and then that's that's really cool okay so uh we, we we'll um start to wrap it up and uh We'll talk a little bit about maybe future ventures you might have, future masterclasses, the Boundary Shop. You've mentioned before that you've created that one because of many requests uh, from artists to, to learn about what it is that you do. And you said there's no magic button, there's no secret. You know, we, we use the same tool. So we just give it to you. We give the scenes and you can learn. So you've recently released a VR scene uh, to the Boundary Shop. So... What's the future for the for the shop? And also, right after that, what do you think is going to happen in our industry? I mean, you're at the top of your game right now, and you have a quite unique uh, view over uh, this field. So in five, ten years from now, what, what is your vision for this field? What can you tell people that's starting out right now? Okay, well, the Boundary Store... Um is exactly as you said it was set up for that purpose you know over a year ago um because people were requesting you know can we have see one of your scenes um i think it's been it's been successful but we've been uh woefully neglectful of it since setting it up largely because we we went from a period where well, of, of expansion you know getting lots of you know bigger commercial jobs and and, and more people and moving offices and setting up you know systems and structures that are required of a bigger a bigger enterprise basically um so that just took all of our time in the last year it has just been you know it's we've had our mind on uh expansion and and uh, and and projects and people um so that's why we haven't really done much to the boundary store and and now you know i'm sort of thinking about you know been talking to jamie uh, about doing expanding it a little bit more actually doing all those scenes that we said we were going to do and actually having had requests for other scenes like people have said are you going to put the superhouse magnus strom's superhouse um on on the uh, store which of course we can it just requires doing it and when it was just you know us messing around and saying okay we'll just build the scene you know we'll just redo this at the weekend i think to to make the boundary store anything more meaningful we we're going to have to actually apply ourselves to it and say okay well we need someone to actually be working on it and actually doing it um and then you know and then we can start to expand into sort of assets and possibly a marketplace that other people you know can sell stuff on if it's really good you know um, I know Peter said, you know, one of the things that the sort of aspirations for the Boundary Store was that if we were going to sell stuff on it, 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 it needn't be a replica of Turbo Squid, for example, where you can get literally anything but of, of any quality. Uh, it needed to have some kind of benchmark where people say, okay, I need something really good, I'll go to the Boundary Store. Not, 
oh, let's look for a, you know, I need a goldfish. I need a low poly goldfish. Let's go to the boundary store. You know, that can, there are other, there are other places for that. We need to sort of set it apart in that respect. A bit like PG skies, you know, is, is just high quality HDRI skies. That's it. So, you know, it's top brand, top quality, you know, best stuff. That's where you go. You don't, you don't go, oh, I wonder if they've got any, you know, HDRIs on 3D Ocean. You say, okay, I want, I want HDRI PG skies. So that's, that I guess is, you know, what, what the future of the boundary store is. Um, what was, what was the second question? The future of business. Well, maybe well, Peter should answer that yeah. one. <laughs> the R&D guy. Um, well, do you mean specifically in terms of R&D and technology? or do you Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I tend to have this kind of conversations with my partner about what, what it is that's going to be like in five years from now. What, what do we need to start thinking about now so we are relevant five years from now? So uh, real-time VR, um, beyond that, you know, kind of like augmented reality uh, experiences, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm probably um, out of everyone in in the office. I'm one of the people who are least excited about VR and augmented reality and things like that because I'm I kind of see the you know keeping keeping up to date with rendering technologies as just a, a continual <laughs> process. And what we love doing is making beautiful images and moving images films um and i i don't think that's going to change uh for us um and you know we 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 did a quite a large vr um just 360 uh project recently which i i kind of saw as a bit of a test okay is this actually going to take off if we do if we apply our same visual quality to 360s, is it going to go like crazy and everyone's going to be the, the best three project? About it? Yeah, but perhaps because it didn't have very much, um, you know, fanfare around its launch and hasn't actually been been plugged very much. Um, I don't think it had the effect uh, we were hoping for. Okay. Um, so that was a little bit of a, a disappointment. Um, so I, I, you know, that was an interesting experiment, but I'm, I'm firmly of the belief that actually a lot of these things might not take off and that we will be just concentrating on doing what we do best. Yeah. I mean, not. photos have been working for many years, so yeah. no reason why they won't work for Definitely. many years to come. And then in, in terms of, you know, just the general technology, obviously, um, everything is becoming easier um uh plugins like corona mean that you can you can start working in a, a much more fluid way when you can actually see what the material you're working with pretty much in real time um and you know everyone when when dslrs came out and in photography, then photographers started to worry that it would become so easy that their jobs would be at risk. And I, I just think that's been proven to be not the case. And there's so many good companies at, at the top of ArcViz at the moment um, who are going to thrive just by continuing to, to being rigorous and always producing good quality images. Um, so that's that's kind of the way I see things going. Okay, cool. Henry? I'll just add to that briefly that um, you can't ever stand still in any, in any rapidly developing industry, which, you know, computer technology is. You, you constantly have to push forward. You can, never, you, can never, you can never sort of rest on your laurels and say, okay, we've got, a good, we've got a good setup here. We've got a good client base. We've got a good workflow. We've got, well, it's nice and stable. We've got comfortable cash flow. We'll just carry on while the times are good. That's just, that's, I mean, that'll work for, for, for a, a while. period. Yeah. Um, but you've got, to, you've got to maintain that energy and that thrust because there's always someone coming up behind you as well. You know, there's always, I mean, in the same way that we've come up behind other established businesses and put quite a few people's noses out of joint because we're starting to take, you know, push things on. Uh, there are plenty of other companies that are racing up behind us um, already, you know, in the whole time, the whole time, which is great. 
as long as you can maintain that interest and that energy to keep to keep getting better and to keep developing uh, with the technology um so that's that's what keeps it exciting for me and that's what keeps it that's where i see the future of the boundary until we just get so old and tired that you know <laughs> as uh, you know and then and then there'll be kids coming out that aren't even born yet who are you know who who overtake us and that's that's just the nature of it yep but yeah keep going as long as we can cool so uh, thanks a lot guys it was a pleasure and uh, hopefully i will uh, visit you again here soon that concludes this week's session big thanks to peter and henry for inviting me to their christmas party and setting up time for this interview you can find session highlights links and more in the show notes on the spectrum.com be sure to subscribe to the show and share with your friends as well have a great week everyone be good do good